Well, hello again. I'm going to read to you from Hebrews chapter 10, um, from verse 19. Letter to the Hebrews written to a disparate group of Christians or groups of Christians spread across the whole of uh, the, the then known world as far as the, the Christians were concerned. Uh, people who had been Jewish believers and were then followers of Jesus. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. May God open his word to us as he also opens our hearts. If I asked you to draw a church, I wonder what you would draw. Would you draw buildings? Would you draw lots of people? Would they be together in a service or would they be on a Zoom call? I'm sure many of us feel isolated and on our own at times, and particularly in recent months, we'll have felt like that, won't we? And in those moments, it's easy to feel doubt and discouragement in our faith. And that's what the writer to the Hebrews was trying to address in the passage we're looking at today. And we're going to begin by looking at just one word. Therefore, I remember a lesson from my ministerial training about understanding New Testament letters. And the lesson is this. If there is a therefore, it's important to see what it's there for. Therefore, in one of the New Testament letters means we're reading part of an ongoing train of thought or argument, as there is here. So what's it there for? Well, in this case, the writer is reminding us that they have been saying what they've been saying so far about what Jesus has done for us. And they use all sorts of language and imagery, which to us in 21st century Britain seems rather strange. But remember, this was written to groups of Jewish Christians who were very familiar with the temple, with the idea of priests and so on. So let's briefly unpack what the context is by looking at those things. First of all, the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was designed to be a place of encounter with God and at the same time to limit access to him. It was a magnificent and visible sign of God's presence in the world, but the layout was designed that fewer and fewer people could reach him. That to us seems cruel and unfair, but there were very good reasons for it. We human beings are sinful and God's all-consuming holiness would destroy any unholiness, so we need protection from him. That's why the temple was designed the way it was. It's a bit like an onion with layers. And as you peel back each layer, you discover fewer and fewer people were allowed access. The outside courtyard, the court of Gentiles, was where anyone could worship God. That's where the traders had set up shop when Jesus cleared them out, angry that the only place which was accessible to everyone from all nations had become a marketplace. From there, only Jewish people could enter the court of women. And that is as far as women could go. Only Jewish men could go into the court of men. From there, only priests could enter the court of priests. And a limited few of those priests were then able to enter the holy place. And right at the centre of the holy place is the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place. 
and this was only accessible to one priest once a year after they'd gone through extensive ritual washing and blood sacrifices and it was cordoned off for the from the rest of the temple by a vast curtain. It was the place of God's presence. And the writer says that together we have confidence to enter the most holy place, the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus. In other words, in his death, Jesus has done all that is necessary for us all to enter God's presence. Nobody now is excluded. And the writer says that we now have a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that one that divided the Holy of Holies from everywhere else, which he says was Jesus's body. When Jesus died on the cross, we're told that the curtain that separated people from the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom. An incredibly powerful symbol. It meant that because Jesus died, anybody could enter God's presence. The writer talks about the way being opened and the way the word is used is the same as the way that the Queen might use it when she says, I now declare this building open. Apologies, Your Majesty, for the impression. Through Jesus' death on the cross, he's declared the way to God open. We can access God. And then the writer changes image again and picks up the image of Jesus as the great priest. In the temple, only the high priest could offer certain sacrifices and certain prayers that would enable people to receive God's forgiveness. And the writer is saying that now Jesus has done the high priest's job in offering himself as a sacrifice once and for all. And his death has made forgiveness and reconciliation with God possible to anyone who comes to faith or comes to him by faith in Jesus. As I said, these images of temple and curtain and high priest were familiar to the Jewish readers of this letter, but less so to us. But the key thing is that all that Jesus has done, represented by these images, is that we can now be at home in God's presence. The writer says, let us draw near to God. And you can equally translate it, that as, let us be at home in God's presence. Because of Jesus' death on the cross, it's as if we can make our home in the Holy of Holies. But this isn't about you on your own. It's about us all together. In John 15, we read Jesus' words to his followers that they should remain or abide in him. And that word abide reflects what the writer to the Hebrews is saying here. Remaining is simply not moving away. Abiding is actually enjoying, actively enjoying being in the presence of God, flourishing in his presence being at home in God's presence. And the writer in the passage we're exploring gives us some ways we can help one another to do this. He talks about having a sincere heart or a true heart. That's one that's being changed by God's spirit. We are being changed from the inside out. In verse 16, Prior to the bit that we're looking at, the writer quotes from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. And that promise about hearts and minds is to God's people collectively, not just to individuals. God's spirit is at work in us as the community of faith. He changes our hearts, our personalities, our thinking and our behaviour as much through our interaction with one another as through his supernatural work and gifts. Through using one another and the work in us, God's spirit enables us to be at home with God together. As we pray together, worship together, read and explore the Bible together, 
and through an openness to listen to him collectively and respond together to what he is saying. He changes our hearts. And we draw near with confidence. The confidence is the full assurance of knowing that Jesus has done everything we need to enter God's presence. It's confidence in him, not in ourselves. Because of Jesus' shed blood and our faith in him, we have full assurance that he welcomes us into his presence. And our confidence is in him, not in our faith. It's all about Jesus. And that's a really good thing to remind ourselves regularly. And actually, if you want a summary in four words of the whole of the book of Hebrews, that's a really good one. It's all about Jesus. And we're washed clean. It's probable that this is a reference to believers' baptism. The writer to the Hebrews assumes that Christians have been baptised. And remember, we're baptised in a church together, not on our own, but in isolation. But there's another element in which this is true for all of us, because we're also washed clean spiritually. Now, unlike those priests, we don't have to go through ritual washing to be clean enough to be in God's presence. Jesus washes us clean by his death. Baptism is an outward sign of our inner cleansing by Jesus's blood. A public event we do together to re remind us of the personal and inner, inner event that happens. And we're not just washed clean from, by Jesus' blood, we're cleansed from a guilty conscience. I'm sure all of us have things that hang heavy on our heart. Things that when we think about them makes us think, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't said that. And yes, we have to deal with the consequences of our actions and seek forgiveness and reconciliation, even as we receive those things from God. But God no longer we no longer need to feel condemnation. We have been forgiven. And that message comes through loud and clear through the letter to the Hebrews and in this passage particularly. And to quote a line from the hymn with which we began, and can it be, which was my baptismal hymn, no condemnation now I dread. So let's remind ourselves regularly that we have been forgiven. The writer also tells us to hold unswervingly to the hope that we have. I don't know if you've ever ridden one of those mechanical bulls where you hold on tight as the machine twists and bucks in even more exaggerated ways to try and make you fall off. Maybe these last eight months, particularly the second season of lockdown, make you feel like you're riding a mechanical bull. The writer tells us to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. That means retain a firm grip. Don't let go like riding that bull. And he urges us to hold on tight to our hope. In biblical terms, it's a sure and certain hope, an expectation that God is faithful to our promises. And again, this isn't something we have to do on our own. We can do it together. Often when someone is riding a mechanical bull, you'll see their friends beside shouting encouragement from the sidelines. And we can shout encouragement from the sidelines for one another as well. We can remind ourselves and each other that the one who promises to be with us always will be with us always. The one who promises to treat us as gently as a broken reed and a smouldering wick does do that. The one who promises that not even death can separate us from his love will always love us. The one who promises to forgive us when we turn back to him will always forgive us. If life feels like a mechanical bull, hold on unswervingly to the faith and hope you have in God's promises. But the great thing is that actually, even if our grip it feels weak, God will never let go of you. I wonder what promises you hold on to. What are the promises that are significant for you right now? It may help you to write them down 
put them somewhere to remind you regularly, write them on a post-it note and stick them somewhere you'll see them regularly. Or maybe to encourage one another, you could send a promise from the Bible as a text message or an email to someone else, a reminder that together we hold unswervingly to the hope in Jesus. We can help one another to make our home in God's presence. The final section of this passage is about lettuce. Not the salad vegetable, but let us. Look at the number of times that the writer says, let us. He's writing about people following Jesus together. And now he makes it explicit by saying, let us spur one another on. Let us not give up meeting together. Let us encourage one another. Like me, you might be feeling despondent about not being able to meet physically with others. But actually, this part of the passage is not limited by our ability or inability to meet in person. We can do all of these things and more so today than ever. We can do them online. We can do them over the phone by email, even by post, if you remember that, as well as in person. So what does it mean that we're in it together? What are the lettuces? Well, the first thing is to spur one another on. When I was a little boy, I got into an awful lot of trouble for pushing my sister into a fish pond. Now, I said I did it because she had provoked me to do it. And the sense of the word that we translate as spur on has that element of risk and challenge. It means provoke to action. The writer to the Hebrews suggests that Christians are meant to provoke one another, not to push into fish ponds, but provoke each other to love and good deeds. We're meant to be challenging and inspiring each other to love in the same extravagant way that God loves us, wanting the best for everyone. So let's give each other permission to spur one another on, to provoke one another. We're meant to be asking each other the awkward questions about what we've done to help others, about how our relationship with God is. Let us meet together, says the writer. We can't live as well as I believe as in isolation as we can together, like barbecue coals that keep each other glowing by being together. In a proper barbecue, if you take one coal out of the barbecue, it very quickly will go cold on its own. Spurring people on is rather difficult if we don't meet together. And yes, meeting together on Zoom like this and other video calls is no substitute for meeting in person. We're all craving that moment when we can be in the same place again, when we can hug and talk without restrictions. But meeting together in this passage is not so much about being physically in the same place as spiritually being in the same place. And that can happen whether we are physically together or not. We can be in tune with one another spiritually if we keep in touch with one another, if we're honest and open with one another, if we're praying with and for one another. We can meet together online, in person and all sorts of ways. Let's not stop doing that. And let's encourage one another. However we meet, we can be encouraging one another on, cheering each other on from the sidelines. Here are a few suggestions. Maybe you could meet weekly with a small group, like a virtual house group, or with a couple of friends as a prayer triplet. You could do it on the phone. You could do it in, on video. Or maybe even you could do it by sending and sharing text messages. Is there someone with whom you can read your Bible online, agree to read the same passage and then discuss what you're learning? I'm doing that at the moment uh, with one of the ministers that I serve. We meet together uh, most Thursday mornings and read a passage. We've been exploring parables and so on and just talk about what God's saying to us. With whom could you share and pray about how you're doing? Because of technology, none of these things needs us to be in the same physical space. But we can encourage one another 
by being in the same place spiritually. Encouraged, I want to encourage you to remind one another regularly that Jesus died for you, that you are forgiven, that you no longer need to feel guilty about things that you've said or done or regret. Here's some homework for you. Think about one person this week that you are going to remind about that. Write it down and then do it this week somehow. The writer to the Hebrew wants us to be confident that because of Jesus, we have access to God. We can make our home in his presence. But that is for us collectively, not just on our own, because being a follower of Jesus is difficult enough when we're with others. Never mind trying to do it on your own. You are God's gift to one another in order to spur one another on and encourage one another. Jesus says we can make our home in God's presence. I'm going to invite you to reflect on what we've heard through a song which is by Andy Flanagan, which reminds us that we're not alone, that we have each other and we have Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are not alone, that because of Jesus, your spirit is with us always, that he is making Jesus real to us, present to us, wherever we are, whatever we're doing. And we thank you too that you have placed us in community, in church, where we are not alone because we are together in you. We thank you that we, because of Jesus, can be at home in the Holy of Holies, that we have intimate access to you, our Heavenly Father. We thank you that because of Jesus, we can be forgiven. We pray that this week you will help us by your Spirit to be together, even though physically we may be distant. To be in the same place spiritually together, to pray with, with each other, to spur one another on, to meet together in different ways and to encourage one another as your spirit enables us to do so. And as we are a blessing to one another, we pray that we might be a blessing to those we meet this week. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.